I hope you enjoyed the program and the de debate and discussion today. You have an all-star lineup. Um, I am going to introduce our first speaker, which is our keynote speaker, and I think he needs no introduction with this group, so I'll keep this brief. Um, welcome to U.S. Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit Chief Judge Jeff Sutton. Chief Judge Sutton earned his law degree from The Ohio State University College of Law. He served as a law clerk for Judge Tom Meskel of the United States Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit, as well as two U.S. Supreme Court justices, Justice Lewis Paul Jr. and Justice Antonin Scalia. Chief Judge Sutton then served stints in private practice in Columbus at Jones Day, and he also served as Solicitor General of Ohio from 1995 to 98. And personally, I think state SGs have some of the coolest jobs in the country, so he may uh, encourage some of you to follow in his footsteps. In May 2001, Chief Judge Sutton was nominated by, to the Sixth Circuit by President George W. Bush and was confirmed almost two years later in April of 2003. Chief Judge Sutton has authored books and articles on a wide variety of topics, including state constitutional law and federalism. I suspect we may all receive a teaser today on his latest work, Who Decides States as Laboratories of Constitutional Experimentation, which will be published on November 1st, according to Amazon, and is available for pre-order now. So we are delighted to have him join us today. Um, so with no further ado, Chief Judge Sutton. Thank you, Lisa. It's so great to be with you all here in Frankfurt. Uh, I was here, I can't tell you exactly, about 15 years ago meeting my college roommate who lives in Nashville, and uh, we met here at dinner and then canoed the Elkhorn River, I think, which is a pretty nice river if you've not canoed it before, but I'd forgotten how beautiful this capital is, so coming here with the mist in the morning, you guys are lucky to live here. And I can't say Kentucky's got a lot of things better than Ohio, but uh, your capital is more beautiful than ours, and I'll I'll leave it at that. Um, well, it's pretty hard to come up with a uh, tasteful COVID story, but you tell me if, uh, if this works. Um, so, I guess it's about 14 months ago, I, I teach quite a bit at the law schools, including at my alma mater, Ohio State, and so about 14 months ago, we're trying to do this dance of how to do hybrid teaching at Ohio State's law school, and the seminar, I think, had about 20 people, 10 were coming live for this first class, 10 were virtual. It's really difficult to do. You've got to get the screens. So we've got all these IT people setting everything up. Ohio State's trying very hard to be careful about all of this. And uh, just as things are ready to go, the students are online, the students are there, I'm ready. There's a, month, a you know, minute or two to go. And um, if you've ever taught with a mask, not an easy thing, uh, something you learn pretty easy early on is to uh, bring some water with you and um, you know you can uh, you of course have to take the mask off to drink the water and maybe you forget the mask is off for a little while and then you eventually put it back on but you keep doing that it makes it a little easier to teach with a mask so just as things are about to be uh, begin i realized oh Ohio State was so good of them they gave us this big goodie bag of you know wipes, masks, instructions about COVID, tons and tons of things, and at the bottom, a water bottle. So I'm like, oh, perfect. So I quickly take it out, unscrew it, big gulp. What is that? Sanitizer. Uh, so to my credit and to the gratitude of the people in the first row, I did not spit it out. Uh, and now what? Um, just remember, this is the first class. We're within the ad drop period. Uh, so I'm not thinking I'm going to tell them what just happened. So I calmly walk out of the classroom. It was an auditorium. They wanted lots of space. And surprisingly, the water fountains were working. Like, that was one of the first things you shut off. And then I'm thinking, seventh grade science, is this one of those dilution situations or the opposite? And so it's got to be a dilution situation. Just drink lots and lots of water. In case you're ever thinking about this, um, I don't care how much water you drink, uh, in two hours you're going to have a really lousy taste in your mouth, so it was an awful class to teach. And some of you are sitting there going, it's in, I'm in Kentucky, moonshine and all that, you're thinking, well, at least it's like 57% alcohol. Well, let me just tell you something, I don't know what kind of alcohol that is, but it ain't the kind we're used to. It didn't do anything for me, uh, except leave a terrible taste in my mouth. So. Lisa's right, I'm a really smart speaker, and uh, you guys are really lucky to have me. Um, 
so I do want to talk about a couple of themes um, from this uh, new book I've got. I know why I can't stop writing, and sad to say I can't stop writing about state capitals, states, and state constitutions. Uh, forgive me, um, but you know I didn't invite myself. You invited me, and I would say this is an assumption of the risk. Uh, if you thought I wasn't going to talk about state constitutions, I don't know what you know planet you're living on. Um, so I, I want to do four laments of an originalist about federal con law. It's going to be a bait and switch eventually, but four laments from an originalist perspective about federal con law. So lament number one from the perspective of 2021 might be the erasing problem. That you look at the original constitution, it's taxed, you look at its original public understanding, the history, and you notice some things that are in that document that the framers and the people of the 18th century cared deeply about, and you notice that they're no longer law. Um, so the erasing problem is the problem of federal courts, people like me, uh, not dignifying the language, the history, and provisions that were originally there, not there, or certainly not there in the same, um, same way. So, you know, everyone's going to have a different list of erasing problems. I'll just give you some examples. They're not necessarily even the ones I would put top of the list, but I just can imagine them being along these lines. Uh, you might have um, eraser, erasing complaints about uh, separation of powers horizontally. Uh, you might say to yourself, gee, how could Chevron and some of our administrative law doctrines be consistent with the original understanding and the strict separation of powers? You might say lack of enforcement of the non-delegation doctrine doesn't seem compatible with the original history or even the text. Uh, you might say federalism, vertical separation of powers between the national government and the states has had some erasing going on over the last 230 years. You might shift your attention uh, to individual rights guarantees. You might say, um, gee, impairment of contract, takings clause doesn't look like they're following either the text or the original public meaning. Um, you know, free exercise would probably generate a pretty healthy debate uh, with this group. Uh, certainly several years ago, I could see someone saying Smith wasn't completely seeming to dignify the original history, you know, see what Mike McConnell has said on that. Um, you know, time the last several years makes me wonder if that's quite as true. Um, this is a court that is policing uh, the, the neutrality, general applicability inquiry a lot more carefully than it once did, so maybe, maybe that's not quite um, as true as it once was. But the point isn't what is on your list of erasing originalist problems. The point I want to make is, you know, how do you prove it? How do you show you're right about this? And the way to show you're right about this, if you care deeply about one of these or something I haven't mentioned, is to go look at the state constitutions. I mean, the thing that always uh, amuses me is people that are such diehard originalists and utterly in, uninterested in state constitutions. I just don't understand how you can be one or the other. You're either both or you're not an originalist. And that's because all of these provisions, the structure, the rights, all came from these original constitutions. And so if you want to prove the U.S. Supreme Court is not playing it straight on impairment of contract or takings clause, the way to prove that is to go look at what these state constitutions originally did. Both of those guarantees did not originate in 1789 or 1791. They originated in the state constitutions. So the way to make your argument and prove you're right, and this erasing problem should be unerased, is to look at these state guarantees. And you know, the story behind these state guarantees is so, it's so surprising. So this, this second book, Who Decides, is all on the structure side of government and the comparison of the federal and state structures. And my experience in the past in looking at individual rights had been that the state courts had not been very innovative, innovative when it comes to individual rights and had been really inclined to lockstep with whatever the federal courts were doing. And I assumed that was because that's all we get in law school is the federal constitution, not the states. It turns out on the structure side, the states are the key innovators. They really have been the ones that have either stuck with the original history or come up with new innovative ways to deal with modern problems in light of that history. So administrative law is such a remarkable example of this. 
So we all know about the non-delegation debate. We, delegation debate, we know about the Chevron debate because all we know is federal con law. It turns out on the state side, those aren't really serious debates at the state level. Uh, so Keith Whittington has this great piece calling the non-delegation doctrine, colon, alive and well. But that's a funny title because most people think, oh, it was only enforced twice in 1935. What are they talking about? What they're talking about is that the state courts, or at least 43 of them, have been vigorously enforcing the non-delegation doctrine low these 230 plus years. Chevron, only two states in the country, state courts in the country, expressly incorporate Chevron into their administrative law. Chevron being the doctrine that says administrative agencies get final deference, complete deference, if their interpretations of an ambiguous statute are reasonable. Only two states expressly incorporate that. That is so different from the individual rights story. Roughly 10 states have a form of deference regime. The other 40 states are markedly not deference regimes. What's going on? Like, how do they do it? Well, some of them um, have said as a matter of state constitutional law, Mississippi is a great example, that Chevron or administrative deference violates the state constitution. Now, these state constitutions, by the way, I'm pretty sure K Kentucky fits in this category. One of the things about them that's so interesting is they not only have implied separation of powers, implied because you say Article I, the legislative power, Article II, the executive power, Article III, the judicial power, that implies separation. The state constitutions have these belt and suspenders express separation of powers clauses where they say no member of the legislative branch may serve in the executive branch. No member of the legislative branch may serve in the judicial branch. Now historically, Gordon Wood says the point of those was, well, it's a little more limited than you might think today, that the point was really separation of personnel rather than separation of powers. That what they really wanted to get rid of was the English system, which by the way still exists, right, in England, the, you not only, it's part of their system to be in the legislature, parliament, and in the executive branch cabinet. That's, that's how it works in England. This was exactly what we were rejecting. And so Gordon Wood hints that, well, maybe that's all they mean. They're just separation of personnel, not separation of powers. Let's just say he's right. Not a great idea to disagree with Gordon Wood on American history, particularly at this era. It's still incredibly consequential for administrative agencies. If separation of personnel is what this was about, do you really think it's consistent with original public meaning to say, oh, we'll, we'll honor that, we'll honor it by creating a fourth branch, and we'll combine all three in that fourth branch. So the original public meaning of separation of powers in administrative law is really stark, and it's not surprising as a result that these state courts have honored it, um, I guess you could say, make a pretty good argument, much more than the federal courts have. Key point, first lament, um, for those of you who think there's been some erasing going on when it comes to the original federal constitution, a way to prove it is to look at the original state constitutions and see what they were doing, particularly why they used this language, how they interpreted it. And that can become a very good reason, very good argument for showing why the federal courts perhaps should switch course. The other thing that these things can also show is sometimes when folks want to um, overrule a decision, the concern is that it will be chaotic, it will be destabilizing. In the administrative law arena, Justice Scalia often warned that if we um, start reinvigorating the non-delegation doctrine, it's going to be very difficult with so many agencies, it'd be hard to find principles distinctions, um, you know, things could come to a halt. Um, the state experiences show the sky will not fall. So for those who think original public meaning matters, for those who think the original public meaning in the states is inconsistent with what has happened on the federal side, these state experiences have a lot to reveal. Second lament, if there can be a problem with original guarantees being erased, there can be a problem with provisions being added over time. So the frame that you become a Supreme Court justice, you get this really cool pen, and one day it can erase, the next day it can add, and when, you, know, you could argue one's no better, no worse than the other. 
Um, so the adding problem, um, again, I'm just using examples. I can imagine people thinking these aren't necessarily mine, and maybe not even yours, but you can think of your own fill in the blank adding provisions. Some people might object that the provisions of the establishment clause have, there's been some adding going on there, that it's hard to believe the original public meaning would prohibit a, a generic prayer at a high school graduation, for example. So in individual rights, you might say there's some adding going on there. You, some people might object to the right to privacy. Substantive due process might be one, although I think in this group those are fighting words, um, which I'm, I'm going to provoke you in just a minute on that. Um, but the point is that just as you can have court decisions that diminish, erase, original public meaning guarantees or structure, the same can happen with adding. Um, so I promise to provoke you um, on substantive due process. I'm not a fan of substantive due process, forgive me. Um, the, uh, you know, my view of uh, things like natural law, you know, go for it. Um, I, there's no doubt from an 18th century historical perspective, natural law is highly consequential to the framers and educated in the 18th century. So that I'm not denying. But what I would note is that our original constitution reflects a lot of those natural law principles, and that's when the courts honor them. And when they're not there, we've got to wait till the constitution's amended or you pass a statute. So property guarantees are a great illustration of that. Property is very consistent with natural law. And lo and behold, you have an impairment of con contract guarantee in the 1789 Constitution. Takings in 1791, of course those should be honored. They're, they're there. But the idea that we federal judges have a license through substantive due process, privileges, privileges and immunities, um, the Ninth Amendment, to kind of make all these other ones up, I, I just got to tell you, I get off the train. Um, now, I will distinguish between two types of substantive due process. One, um, tolerable, the other, horrid. Uh, the tolerable one is the incorporation one, because at least with incorporation, what's being, you know, what the court is doing is deciding that certain Bill of Rights provisions that at least were written, they're there, you can read them, were incorporated through substantive due process, the Liberty Clause of the 14th Amendment. So that I would consider tolerable. Um, as to the other, I'll just tell you what I've said about it in print uh, in, in a, a case. Oddly enough, an arbitration case. Um, so I had this arbitration case and um, enforcement of an arbitration agreement. If you know my decisions in this area, that's not a great place to go with me. If people want to have a contract that says we'll arbitrate it, then do that and don't go for a second chance in front of the court. That usually is how I'm going to think about it. In this particular one, um, they got kind of energized, the losing party, and said, well, if you enforce the arbitration agreement, it violates substantive due process. Oh, I was so the wrong person to make that argument in front of. Um, so this is where I just really got going. So forgive me, and please challenge me in the Q&A on this. Um, but here's what I said about substantive due process, at least in the arbitration context. I, something like this. If I started deciding cases as a Sixth Circuit judge based on flipping a coin, heads the appellant wins, tails the appellee wins, always very consistent, um, articles of impeachment would soon be drawn against Judge Sutton. And I think fairly so, because that's a really arbitrary way to decide who wins. That's not right. The worst part of substantive due process is that it makes flipping a coin look fair. At least flipping a coin is neutral. If you don't know which way it's going to go, ask yourself how many substantive due process rights, unanchored in text, unanchored in history, were inconsistent with the worldview of the judge that found them. Give me a coin flip any day. That is my view of substantive due process. So that's lament number two, the adding problem. Where do we find out that the US Supreme Court has not honored these things? Again, back to state constitutions. Have, are they, have they innovated these things? And if they haven't, you really have to wonder if what the federal courts have done is consistent with original public meaning. Lament number three, really tricky debate. What do we do with stare decisis? Now, in one sense, 
the state courts don't have a lot to offer because on the, while the state courts innovated judicial review, lost on most American lawyers, everyone assumes it starts in 1803 with Marbury versus Madison, wrong, wrong, wrong. You know, John Marshall could never have been born. Marbury versus Madison could never have happened. There could never have been an election of 1800 there still would be American judicial review and the federal courts eventually would have adopted it because that's what the state courts were doing before 1789. Now, that proves to us judicial review is a good idea, Marbury versus Madison's right. It's not that helpful in telling us how to handle stare decisis. And the reason it's not that helpful, or it leads to plenty of complications, is on the one hand, we know the state courts 1776 up to 1789, and the British courts before them, the British common law, used stare decisis. So in one sense, that suggests, okay, well, obviously judicial review must have stare decisis, because when they wrote Article Three, they would have assumed judges would exercise these same powers in similar ways. But that lesson isn't as powerful as you might hope, because what the judges were doing primarily was common law decision making, and Stare decisis is the foundation of common law decision making. The, the whole idea is premised on starting with that precedent and moving forward, usually distinguishing, adding, not overruling. But of course, they didn't have English common law, this concept of a written constitution, judicial review, and what do you do with a mistaken decision. And the state courts, while before 1789 had innovated judicial review, they hadn't had a long enough period to decide, oh wait, that Rhode Island decision from 1784 was wrong. How does stare decisis work? So this, this, is un, this is the hard part of this, that the state court's experience definitely vindicates judicial review. It vindicates the idea that some form of stare decisis had to be baked into Article Three, but what it is, is hard to say. Now Justice Thomas, you know, you know, God bless Justice Thomas, trying so hard to be neutral about this and realizing that the current stare decisis test is very squishy, leaves plenty of room for worldviews entering into the equation. Justice Thomas says, well, you gotta look to the original public meaning and if it's demonstrably mistaken, key word, that's enough for him. You gotta love that because it's neutral. It doesn't have any other squishy factors. Now I have to say, Demonstrably is a little squishy, and you know maybe maybe I could agree with Justice Thomas, and maybe he and I, because I probably am a little more likely to, uh, you know, stick with the precedent than I think he would be. So maybe the word demonstrably allows us to live together on that. I mean, I'm a court of appeals judge; we're not living together in any respect whatsoever. I don't I don't mean it that way in terms of just ex agreeing with what he's doing. Well, whatever you think about that, um, I don't really have a great answer. But I told you the states will be the answer to everything. And I do have another state-centric answer that is not, it does not seem to me to be part of the conversation. And it seems to me it should be part of the conversation. If you think a decision is wrong, and by the way, you never have a stare decisis debate unless everyone agrees it's wrong. So the assumption is it's wrong. That means it is a constitutional decision that either added something that's not there or erase something that is there. What does that mean? What does it mean when the court adds something that's not there or erases something that is there? It's amended the Constitution by interpretation. And that's the thing that we should be making part of the conversation. That means you're end running the three quarters um, ratification requirement, the three quarters of the states, their state legislatures, approve this kind of constitutional amendment. And it seems to me that is, that is a healthy way to think about it. One consideration, it's, it's not easy to measure for sure, is when you're debating whether to overrule something, has this really received a supermajority support in the states? Um, some ways yet can be shown by state legislation, some ways by state constitutional amendments, some ways by state court decisions. It's gonna be a loose, criterion because, of course, they didn't go through the ratification process. So it's very hard to prove exactly what would have happened. But quite often, in many of these areas, particularly in the erasing setting, I think you'll understand why I'm saying this, when they've erased something, that allows the states to fill the gap. So when the states have filled the gap, it is quite obvious where we are when it comes to 75%. 
In the adding situation, where the court is taking it off the table, prohibited anybody from dealing with it, it's quite a bit more difficult um, to, to figure out whether that's something that ought to be re revisited. But it does seem to me, stereotysis is it's just inextricably tricky, but that ought to be part of the conversation as to what actually did happen. Um, you know, one of the ironies of the amendment process, again, back to states versus federal government, you know, Madison and Jefferson agreed, I mean, they lived 20 miles apart. Virginians, presidents, uh, I mean, they, they shared just about everything. Very close friends, one writes the Bill of Rights, one the Declaration of Independence, I mean, it's astonishing. And they agreed eventually, not always at the time, but eventually on almost everything. The key area of disagreement about constitutions was how often they should be amended. So Jefferson famously was once a generation guy, no dead hand control, so every 19, 20 years, Madison was, whoa, 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 if you amend it, it will lose respect, and the way to venerate something or create a venerable constitution is by not changing it. So most people would say, if you look at the US Constitution, well, Madison won that debate, three quarters, that's really hard. Jefferson clearly won at the states, because most states you can amend with a 51% vote. That's very easy. Each generation can do what it wishes. There's been over 7,500 state constitutional amendments, so that's a lot. The US, just 27. Two don't count, prohibition. Uh, we're down to 25. 10 come as part of the original bargain. We're down to 15. It's not, not a lot of federal constitutional amendments. So you would say, oh, good for Madison. He won on the venerability point. But now ask yourself, where is the evidence for the amendment of the US Constitution? Is it just the 27 amendments? Is that all that's happened that changed the original public meaning of the US Constitution? No, I think you'd have to consult the US reports. And then you start to have to ask, well, did Madison really win? And how stable is this thing? So everyone says Madison won, but the more there's an amendment by interpretation, the less that's actually true. Lament number four. It is really hard to imagine that we fought the War of Independence, broke from Britain, and decided the way we're going to have a great government, democracy, democracy, uh, would be to have nine life tenure justices and five of them being able to make these critical decisions about key issues in American government, social policy, you name it. It's just, I say, impossible to deny that the footprint of the federal courts is just way beyond what the ratifiers, the drafters, anyone in the 18th century would have envisioned. Um, to my knowledge, there is no country in world history that has embraced judicially enforceable rights more than we Americans have. In fact, I don't blame the court, I blame us. I think we love it. <laughs> I think we love it. I, I don't get it because it means you're going to win half the time and lose half the time and all the time lose a right to vote about something, so I just never quite got it, but we Americans love judicial review. As a federal judge, I'm inclined to say, let this ship keep going. Uh, if you got a government job, why not have more power rather than less? If you manage money, why not manage more rather than less? But I don't think it's sustainable, and I think any of us who've gone through the confirmation process the last couple decades, anyone watching the confirmation process last, couple decades realizes that's what has happened with so many judicially enforceable rights in this American phenomenon of identifying new federal constitutional rights is the American people have caught on how significant the court is. And so what's happened is the political pressure, politics is getting what you want and having a society you want to live in. It's like, you know, running the Colorado River through a backyard rivulet. I mean, you, you, that's just too much pressure to handle a presidential election every four years, Senate elections, and so forth. And it's also just very strange. I mean, voting for President of the United States as a proxy to fill a seat on the court? I mean, what an unusual development. So I think most people would accept that the footprint of the federal courts is bigger than anyone would have imagined. And even living constitutionalists, I would guess, would say that um, it's probably bigger than is healthy and is not sustainable. So the question is, what do you do about it? One option is to run around the country saying judicially enforceable rights are bad, judges can't be trusted. 
I'm not going to lead that parade. Uh, I, I like judges, state and federal, and I think we're doing the best we can. I do think the state courts offer a really useful way of helping to handle this problem. And I, I basically have two thoughts on that one. Thought number one is um, to basically change the way we innovate these new rights. If we want to, if, if this is an American thing we want to continue with, why don't we embrace the Brandeis approach to innovation, innovation and legislation? So, you know, this is the Brandeis quote that I think most Americans still embrace, that we have a new social problem, COVID, the pan, you know, data privacy, opioids. A brave legislature can try an experiment. If it works, another state can borrow it. If it really works, Congress can nationalize it. Why is that not the way? It's, if, we, if we want to innovate new federal constitutional rights, if we want to do it through vehicles like substantive due process or vague guarantees, why wouldn't we let the state courts be the experimenters in chief? So all I'm saying is take the Brandeis idea for state legislatures and fold it onto state courts. Let them be the innovators in chief. And if, if they get ahead of their skis, whatever the metaphor, cliche you want to use, um, the nice thing about state courts as innovators, the people have much more of a say over the meaning of their constitution and who their state court judges are than is true on the federal side. Mistakes are just easier to correct there. Um, you can not elect that state court judge. You can amend the state constitution if you disagree with the opinion. Those options just aren't really available on the federal side. So it just makes much more sense to have the state courts be the innovators in chief, the first responders to new ideas as to developing new national rights. The second point, which is probably the one I really think about and cannot stop thinking about as I'm driving through this beautiful state of yours, is not everything has to be nationalized. There isn't a single solution to all of this stuff. There are some Kentucky values. There are some things that started here, should stay here, and maybe some smart Ohioans will import them, but I don't think it'll be smart New Yorkers that aren't gonna import them. And so be it, there's just nothing wrong with that. Uh, it's a very big country, 330 million people. In fact, if I had one gripe, it's that the people in the big cities off in the coast don't appreciate how much there is in between and how different things can be and how many different ways people can live their lives. I'm, I'm not about getting rid of the federal backstop remotely, but I don't embrace the idea that everything needs a federal backstop um, and certainly not right out of the box. So if I didn't provoke you so far, um, I'll stay for lunch and try, try again, but I'm pretty confident I did. So I, I'd love questions from any angle at all, any perspective at all. And thank you for inviting me to this beautiful state capital, uh, people's house, I guess it's the people's house. How funny a federal judge is here. If I were a state legislator, I would not let a federal judge here. It, we, we've not done, been very good for state legislators. In fact, that's one of the, one of the chapters begins. At the founding, state legislators were in the pole position in power in American government. And that's not how, they haven't stayed in the pole position. Uh, something's happened. So I'd love some questions. And a chance to have some water that's not sanitizer. <laughs> Who decides? And if I just, forgive me for getting on my soapbox, why don't we just ask that question? Every time there's something that agitates you, why do we not talk about, it's all, all we Americans, we're just, I guess we're all focused on victory. You know, win the wars, defeat the pandemic. I'm with, I love that, I'm, I'm a proud American. But sometimes we should say, whose choice is this? Is this, is this a local, is this a neighborhood choice? Is this a family choice? Is this a county choice? I, we don't ask that question enough. And I guess it's because we want to win. I, I mean, I, we're impatient, we want to win. It's as American as it gets. But it's not always healthy. So, yeah, but I, I, that's why I wish we would orient ourselves more around that. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, I, I circulated this draft to a bunch of friends, and one of them uh, said, Jeff, I just spent the year in New Zealand, and I think they have a much better approach to this than what you're recommending. And New Zealand, it, well, first of all, it's an island. 
4 million people and 40 million sheep, and they're not worried about the sheep getting pandemic. I mean, it's a very different situation. But I, my response is to, and I, I had to write, I, so this is in the introduction, the pandemic, so I'm very sensitive to this point, as you can probably tell, and maybe even getting defensive. Um, it's not either or. So I, I completely agree with you that there's some features of dealing with a national existential crisis like the pandemic, such as expediting the production of a vaccine, that, that would have been ludicrous. But think of the other things. The, the reason federalism is a, a huge virtue when you don't know the answers is it's so much better to experiment in smaller populations. So take, you know, I'm not taking a cheap shot at a state or a governor when I say this. It's just a reality of not knowing everything at a time when there's a lot of difficult choices to be made. So think of the choice of, you know, we're, we don't have enough hospital beds. Let's take people 65 and over and put them in nursing homes. That would not have been a good choice to nationalize. It was an easy mistake to make under the circumstances. I'm not second guessing that person remotely, but that would not have been a good thing to nationalize. So the key thing is once you have an answer, once you really do know the right way to do this, of course you nationalize it. But my, my key thing is until then, use federalism. It just doesn't make any sense to nationalize something, even something you have a lot of conviction about, but you really don't know. And God knows one thing, we are not in charge in this one. And there are still a lot of unknowns. Um, so it's not either or. I feel the same way about our lingering issues with race. Who would wanna say that um, we're only gonna have the national government deal with this? It just doesn't make any sense. You know, in, take the Buck versus Bell eugenics story. People that believe in nationalizing answers, the eugenicists thought they had the right answer. We're gonna eliminate people with disabilities. No one will, quote, suffer through this. That was their orientation. Again, I'm not trying to second guess them. I think they were trying to solve a problem. They were, these were good people. But that was a, Buck versus Bell, terrible idea to nationalize. Very good that the states um, have a second chance there. Um, you know, MAP versus Ohio is another example of this. This just blows me away. So we nationalized the exclusionary rule, not impatiently. It takes 75 years before MAP versus Ohio. That is a lot of patience. In Wolf, they incorporate it. They leave another 12 years for more experimentation. By the time of MAP, half the states have an exclusionary rule. And the court, it's, it's, I don't think it's a five, it's like a 6372 decision. So it's a form of supermajority says, you know, the problem with this patchwork of different rules on the Fourth Amendment, different rules on exclusion, is it's not fair, right? I mean, someone in Arkansas doesn't get the benefit of some, something someone in Connecticut gets. We, it's, it's, it's the Fourth Amendment, the federal Fourth Amendment. We've got to nationalize it. There is more disuniformity with application of the exclusionary rule today than there was before 1961. Why is that? What the US Supreme Court can pull up, it can pull down. It innovated with Leon, the good faith exception. Half the states roughly don't follow Leon. Does anyone complain about disuniformity with the exclusionary rule? No. Uniformity is a proxy for whether you like something. That's all it is. I'm, I'm not being critical of you at all. I'm, I'm just, it took me a while to figure this one out, um, but that's usually what it is. And I'm all for that with the pandemic, but I don't wanna do it based on like. I wanna do it when like we really, it is a very good idea to nationalize the production of vaccines. I, I can't see another argument there. I mean, Ohio gonna beat everyone on vaccines? I mean, I love Ohioans, but I don't see it. And maybe Kentuckians would, but uh, I don't see it. But that's such a great question because the pandemic really illustrates the times states are not a useful tool, but I think it also illustrates when they can be, and I think it can illustrate the peril of nationalizing prematurely. Yes. Ah, uh, I knew I'd get somebody. Are you agreeing with me? 
I never get agreement in a Fed sock event. That, well, I love it. Keep going. I like agreement, but I'm just a little surprised. Well, so, you know, my, you know, my perspective, I, I'm, I consider myself, you know, I like to think about original public meaning, and I feel like that's the way a federal judge should do it. I have a whole chapter in the book about, you know, why Thayer is not right, deference to Thayer is not right, but why there are some limitations on federal courts innovating new rights. But in the book, I throw an olive branch, and my olive branch is to say, I may be wrong, let's be humble about this, the other side may be completely right, is if we're going to have substantive due process, if we're going to have uh, vague accretions of new rights or accretions of vague rights, um, let's at least look to the states. And if you can show me that 75% of the states have done it, I'm all for it because that proves this is not a game. That proves you're not end running the three quarters amendment process or gerrymandering by another name. I mean, the first chapter of the book is umpiring and gerrymandering. I mean, I, it doesn't take a lot of imagination to see where I'm coming from on that. If we, we as a American people think extreme partisan gerrymandering is very problematic in this country, I agree 100% with that. It has been, it's created polarization, it has all these impacts. How can we all agree that extreme partisan gerrymandering is really, really bad, but think it's okay to take the biggest issues we fight about and have five life tenure justices decide them? So you've got to show me when we're preserving something that's not gerrymandering. And one way to have this debate is to find out where are the American people? And if it was something that was innovated, power taken, you know, if the American people have come to accept it, let bygones be bygones as part of my compromise. I'm not just saying that for this, as a compromise I will do that. But I certainly don't think it's right to compromise and then let five justices innovate things that just aren't there. It's not right. And it is gerrymandering. And I think we should say it's gerrymandering. And then decide, well, maybe gerrymandering could. <laughs> Which I don't think is going to be the conclusion. So I think we're, I'll take one more question, but Phil, I think I don't want to, we want the trains to run on time. All right, well, it's so great to be with you. Thank you so much for inviting me.